Rebecca! Hello everyone, uh, this is Your Soul, and I'm here with Danny Shine at the London Cryptocurrency Show down in Hammersmith. And we just took some time out uh, during the preparations to come and have a chat. So we thought we'd uh, make a recording and uh, see if we can come up with some interesting topics that you might like to uh, check out and comment. And uh, yeah, so I think um, Danny, from what I understand, is interested in talking a little bit about. Um, Anarchist philosophy, maybe, and some money-related things. So I don't know. Yeah. So um, this year I went. I went to an Acapulco for my second trip, and I ended up doing an interview with. In, he was interviewing me, I guess, with Jeff Berwick, and there were some things that he said that I actually found quite disturbing. Some of them were subtle. Some of them were less subtle. For example, he said that you know someone came to his house um, to, to nick his stuff. He would shoot them, and um, that he you know he didn't. He was against the idea of charity. I was trying to bring up the idea that steam can be used to help people in a kind of chari- charitable way. And would he be prepared to do that? And he kind of brushed it all off. Oh no, I'm not doing that. And um, and you know, and at the end of the conversation, he's oh, I've got to go and speak to someone important. <laughs> Which is, you know, fine because I'm not in any, you know, I'm not any, I'm not important. That's I don't claim to be important at all, but I'm not sure that, that the person he was speaking to was important either. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I haven't gone back to him on that. But it's sort of uh, when I spoke to uh, uh, my mentor, um, who I hope to introduce to the web shortly, um, about it, he was scathing, and he introduced me to the work of Peter Joseph. And Peter Joseph um, is the creator of the Zeitgeist films and movement. And I've been watching quite a lot of his stuff and I found it really refreshing and interesting. And I just wanted to sort of just chat to you about the, you know, what he says and, and how it seems to differ from anarcho-capitalism, which I realise now is something that I feel very uncomfortable about. Um, and, and the discomfort is because... You know, anarcho, uh, the, the anarchists, and, the, you know, and, there, and I remember, by the way, another thing which we sort of share as well. When I was, there were a few things that happened when I was out in, in uh, Acapulco. There were a couple of things that really stuck in my mind. One was, and this was not necessarily um, anything to do with the, the, uh, the uh, people who organised uh, an Acapulco, who did organise vegan meals, which was great. But there, at one stage, they had a pig on a spit right in the middle of a hotel. And, and that reminded me of the whole idea of you know, people who claim they're into anarchy but don't seem to extend that to animals. Um, but more importantly, um, there was one incident where I, I went into the lift to get into my room uh, early in the morning at 7 o'clock and then at 3 o'clock uh, I got back into that same lift and there was a woman in there who'd been in that lift all day polishing the, the, the glass on the lift. Uh, and... The, and I realised, and Peter Joseph uh, explains this and articulates this so well, that there's so much violence, the huge amount of violence, uh, which is part of the structure of capitalism. I don't even like calling it capitalism, I call it exploitationism. Um, and it, it seems like anarcho capitalists um, are, you know, they're just really greedy people who don't want the government to take any of their money. and don't really give a crap about poor people and to hell with them. Um, and I don't, I, and Peter Joseph seems to be one of the only people that is saying we, we need to do something about this, this system, the, the whole idea of the economy, the whole idea of trading. Um, and, and as a friend of mine, uh, this friend actually, that's very scathing, he, his words are, he says, you know, his words are, we are one, we are one family, stop this fuckery. That's his solution, right? That, that if we realise that you and I and everybody is part of one family, we don't charge our family for stuff. We do it for free. And, and therefore, that that's the way forward. And that that, that realisation would lead to stopping this whole idea of trading and the scarcity. And again, there's this whole, you know, the, the cryptocurrency thing. We've spoken briefly about this, but the cryptocurrency thing is, may, may, if it's a step in that direction, great. But at the moment, you know, it's... It's all based again on this whole idea of scarcity, of competition, 
And, and Peter seems to be the only one that I'm aware of, and he probably isn't, but the only one that I'm aware of that, that, that is talking extensively about this. I'm sure there are more. I also came across this guy called Anarcho Pack, who's a guy who's this, you know, who, who makes Jeff look really not very bright, to be honest, because he's you know, seriously talking about anarchism and different types of anarchism and anarchist philosophy. So I, I just wanted to sort of put that out there and see what you had to say about that. Sure, okay. I mean, this is a, a subject that I talk about a lot on forums and have covered a lot of ground with, um, with different people on this subject already. And I agree with you, basically, in, front, in principle, what you're saying. I, I'll, I'll start off with the, the friendly side to anarcho-capitalists by basically saying that whenever we talk about a group of people and there's a very large number of them, it's not really fair to put them all in one category and say they're all this, they're all that. Um, there are people who call themselves anarcho-capitalists who are, I would say, deeply unpleasant and exploitative people. And then there are also people who are probably very caring and intelligent and they just like to trade and they like to... They like the idea of being rewarded for their creativity and so on, and they, they see money and trade as being a valid way to do that. Um, and that's quite a broad spectrum, and it's much like the world in general, where you have scumbags and kind of you know, good people, basically. So that would be my first point. Um, and just because uh, you know, you know, you're a capitalist or an anarcho-capitalist doesn't automatically mean that you've lost the plot or that you've, you've missed everything that's important in life. Um, but I do basically agree that capitalism at its core um, relies on a form of overpowering. Um, and, and I think this is where the problem has arisen, is within the definitions people are using, because they've drawn a line in their mind as to what anarchy is. And they've said, well, for example, anarchy means there's no rulers. So that basically means we don't have a, a hierarchic governmental system telling us what to do. Um, but we can basically, uh, outside of that, we can do whatever we want as long as we don't overpower anyone else. But they don't take into consideration that simply by increasing the amount of resources they hold on to, they are basically overpowering other people. Um, and, and, and that's when it gets into this sort of, the real core of it, or the real heart of the issue. And, and usually I find people try to avoid the subject when I, when I bring that up in, in a lot of conversations I've had. Um, or they'll say, oh, you obviously haven't studied Austrian economics, or you obviously haven't read this or that. And I'll say, no, well, actually I have. Uh, and then, and then it, it's just happened a few times where I've been sending things, so I look at it, and I'm like, this has got nothing to do with what we're talking about. So there's a lot of distraction going on, and people don't like to be told um, or pointed to something that they hold true, and, and to be shown that it might not be exactly true, especially if they've spent 20 years telling everyone how, how great that idea is. It's actually a quote that I posted recently from Tolstoy, where he's basically saying that, that was along the lines of, um, uh, even the most intelligent man who's capable of dealing with the most complex of problems, um, when faced with a, a simple truth that contradicts his whole kind of ethos and what he's been telling his colleagues and teaching people, he, he won't be able to handle that. Um, you know, that's almost universal throughout life. Um, and it's that whole pride um, and fear and all these different emotional aspects which we're very good at avoiding completely, um, which are actually running the show, basically. They're, they're keeping everyone's thoughts channeled in a certain direction and part of the thoughts are, we won't talk about those emotions, we won't deal with them, we're just going to... They don't exist, it's fine. And then naturally the result of that is we're stuck in a very narrow band of thought and when someone tries to challenge that, we reject it because we're also rejecting the emotions that are associated with it. So basically to understand this problem means understanding yourself, as it usually does, and, and understanding the, the mechanics of consciousness, I would say. And, and when you can understand that, then you understand the motivations behind not just capitalism, but also the problems people have with being challenged about it. Um, to, is it it's like that. There's another saying, isn't there? You know that it's um, difficult for a man to understand something um, if his misunderstanding of it is, is part of his living. Even right, if he makes yeah. money out of, out yeah, of yeah. misunderstanding of it. Yeah. So it's, and it's fine because I find it really one of the things I'm. I did it today actually. Try to trying to explain to a police officer, for example, why a lot of the rules that they're enforcing are completely illegitimate and immoral is really, really difficult. I find it really, really difficult. Because uh, because you know their living depends on on doing that. Yeah. Um, so we've all, we've all got strong desires to survive, and it's it's at the core of who we are. It's driving us. Everything we're doing to a certain extent is there, or a lot of it is there to keep us alive. So, but because we're in this society that's got us disconnected from each other and from nature and from the source of our actual source of the universe, basically, we are now stuck separate, and we're holding on to all these rules and, and systems that are designed to try and keep us, you know 
not go insane, but also help us to survive. Uh, and so if anything comes along that challenges that, we're a bit lost. We're a bit kind of like, well, what would we do with that? Though? We don't really know. And that's really the problem. People are basically disconnected from what I would call spirit. Some people would call God. I, I would just call it the energy that creates universes. Basically, we've been disconnected from reality, and we've called that disconnection reality. So, so, <laughs> so the reality is most people are psychotic, and, and the people whose job it is to decide who's psychotic and who isn't are saying that the psychosis is quite natural and normal. Um, so it's not surprising that we have difficulty dealing with you know, trying to change that. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> I mean that's one one of the, the the reasons why I'm so averse to calling myself anything. Okay. I would definitely call myself an anarcho-capitalist, and I don't even call like to call myself an anarchist because um, I don't I don't really know enough about it. And even if I did, um, I, I the, the only thing that I try and uh, that, I'm tr that I feel comfortable identifying as is someone who attempts. To have as an open mind as I can, with the knowledge that I, I too um, struggle with this, with the emotional, um, the emotional, um, what you were talking about, you know, the, the emotional things that come up when things that I've been speaking about passionately for, for a while are challenged. It, it, I can, I, I notice that within myself, and that's why I, I you know, I, I stay away from being put in any particular box because. You know, I try and let it develop all the time. Yeah. So, so, but the difference between you and a lot of people is that you're you intend to have an open mind and to get to the truth, as opposed to um, not even considering that. Just you, you know, the people that we're maybe having problems with who are very systematized and who have a closed mind, really thinking approach, they're just in their box, and this is what's true, and anything outside of that is not really relevant or interesting because this is what keeps everything safe. Uh, and you know, whereas you are quite, I would, from what I gather, you're much more open and, and you're willing to accept that there's much more going outside, on outside of that box. And while you might feel like you need to protect, defend yourself against challenges to what you think is true, you are at least understanding that being told you're wrong is a good thing if you actually are wrong, because then you're going to be able to find the deeper level of truth. And you're basically, you're on a journey, and a lot of people aren't on a journey. I think that's what it comes down to in the same way, uh, towards finding the truth. Um, I, I find, by the way, uh, just to interject, I, I find I, I was in a conversation today with quite a hostile conversation with a with a doctor, a medical doctor, and I didn't I didn't take any breaks at all. I didn't count for thirty because I, I find that, that is so important for me when I'm having this conversation with someone who's hostile and and it, before long I'm just getting it's a complete waste of time because I'm we're just sort of bouncing this negative energy back and forward. And that's why I find that, that you know that meditation, thirty seconds to a minute, is crucial um, if I'm going to be open to, to being challenged. Um, yeah. So so um, talking about Peter Joseph, I, I, you know, I'd recommend people to look into what he has to say. Um, are there any other uh, thinkers that are speaking today about um, about that type of thing, about the, the, the necessary? systemic, deep systemic change and deep systemic problems of exploitationism, um, which is the word I use for okay. capitalism, uh, that you know about, that you're, that you, yeah. Um, I find there's definitely not enough, um, and I think the people that I do hear talking about it aren't very well known, so they're going to be people that I personally have met in forums and someone who I really resonate with and we share our understanding. Um, I mean, I'm probably the most vocal person I know who talks about these things. And I'm not that well known, so I mean, there's probably lots of people like me who aren't so well known, who are quite active, but because they're so challenging to the mainstream system, you're never going to hear about them because the mainstream system is basically locked down. So um, it's funny because um, a couple, I think Peter Joseph made a couple of mistakes, which is obviously absolutely natural and uh, in fact necessary. Um, and the, t those two mistakes, I'm sure he's made more, but those two mistakes were going on the Alex Jones show okay. and going on the Joe Rogan show. Right. And Alex Jones just, you know, just absolutely went for him. It. It, and it was just, it was, it was atrocious. Mm -hmm. He also went on Stephen Molyneux's show, and again, it was interesting because it really exposed, in my opinion, both Stephen Molyneux as, uh, you know, as having some major cracks in his, in his logic, even though I think he, does, he says some good things. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, my, my perspective of Alex Jones being well known, 
um, and Joe Rogan is that they're, they're all intelligent to a point, they all have deep understandings of certain things, but they've also got a denial point. They've got an area, like most people do, an area within their process where they're in complete denial of certain things. Um, and so it's like a black hole in their logic and, and you can't get near it. And they're gonna, it's, like a, it's like you've approached the nest of a, of a tiger or something like that, or a tiger's home, they're gonna defend it. They're gonna get angry. They've got this rage surrounding that energy and, and it's basically, no, you're not going anywhere near that. No, we're not challenging that. No, 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 no. You know, you're a communist or whatever it is they're gonna say yeah. to, to try and shut you up. It's completely irrational, and and the thing is that you know Alex Jones is a good example where he becomes this whole like, animated character of you know like a circus, um, I don't know, performer of some kind where he gets inflated and you know like he's charging some sort of military charge against some sort of uh, evil empire or something like that. But that's what it is. It's all a bluff, isn't it? Basically, and I remember when he was in court um, for for um, for having his children. Um, I can't remember. I can't think of the word, but he basically separated from his wife and they were um, having a court case about the children. And he came out in court, his defence basically was, oh yeah, the person you see on the screen is not a real person, it's just a character. I'm not really like that. Um, you know, it's just entertainment, basically. And you know, that is another form of denial, because he's literally, his whole life is structured around being that person, at least as far as we see it. And if, and if that's all a lie, then why are we watching him? Why is anyone watching him? And if it's not a lie, then he's just lied in court, you know, so... Basically, it's always denial, isn't it? It's all not a lack of self acceptance and a lack of just being okay with being yourself in the present moment. And, and in a way, that's kind of what anarchy is: is being is that sort of Zen state of, to, in, in a certain sense, of being completely just at peace with being yourself right now, without feeling the need to run to someone else to tell you what to do, or to bow down to someone else, or anything. Basically, it's just oh, how, how rebellious you're just going to sit down and do nothing. You know, and, and for a lot of people, that is rebellious. It's kind of like, "Whoa, you're lazy. Why, why aren't you working?" You know, all this kind of stuff. Get a job. <laughs> it's like, "Well, I'm just sitting down." <laughs> it's anarchy. But you don't need a name for that. It's just, it's basically just being natural, isn't it? It's just being yourself. And, and a lot of people can't be themselves because they hate themselves. That's really what it comes down to. They would rather pretend they're not themselves than just accept themselves for who they are. So, and, uh, and talking about, we, we spoke earlier actually before we started filming about about denial and how um, common you know, how common that is across the board. And I certainly, um, you know, I notice that there's a huge amount of denial that I notice in my life. And the way I, I uncover it um, is by spending time attending meetings and talking to people who are also um, on a journey of uncovering their denial. I personally do it by um, being involved with the 12-step program which I find really, really touching, moving, and powerful, and, and quite miraculous in many cases. Um, how do you do it? How do you, how do you uncover your own denial? Um, I actually have a specific process which I've been taught from a set of books which I use for healing, which are almost unknown, but they are probably the most important books on planet Earth, from my perspective. Um, what are those books? Uh, there are a set of books that were channeled um, in the beginning of the 1980s up to 2010, um, in America by a lady, and uh, yeah, they're not... What are they called? Um, the series is called Right Use of Will, so it's teaching you the right use of your will, and it's from Spirit, and she, she when she channeled these books, said, it was God speaking to me, and basically I received 400 pages, and this is how you're going to survive on planet Earth, do this, basically. Uh, and when I first read those books, I didn't even really accept that God was real, and I was just kind of like, well, I'll read it because it was recommended to me by someone who I respect. And I was kind of, you know, a bit cynical and, you know, well, all right. but I read through it. I was like, well, yeah, that's probably some of the most smartest texts I've ever read on anything ever. And I can't disagree with any of it. So I kept going and I put it into practice. I, I, at that time, I, I had a serious car accident injury whiplash, basically. My spine was all misaligned. And I've been to lots of specialists. And I used this approach that's taught in the, that, those books for healing and I actually healed my own spine. So the vertebra moved back into place as I expressed emotions and trauma and things. And, cried for maybe 10 minutes or 5 minutes and I was an inch taller you know, after that after that session I was literally taller and the woman who was with me pointed it out and at that moment I realised wow this is exactly true what's in this you know, I can't I've got sure every word in those books but the parts that I've used definitely are correct and they are definitely talking about subjects that almost no one really understands um, so the, the approach that they give is a, is a technique called judgment release which is where it's basically saying a judgment is a thought form which is attached to you, the thinker, and it defines that something is something. 
so dogs are scary, or something like that. And the key about that kind of a thought form is that it has some sort of denial inside of it. So it's blocking out a truth, it's hiding something. And it seems to be true on the surface, but the more you feel it, and the more you feel, hang on a minute, is that, do I really feel everything about that's true? It's all about using your intuition and your, and your feminine aspects to think with you, so that you can decode the thoughts you're thinking to find out whether they are judgments and whether there's denial and that kind of thing. Um, so, for example, in the example of dogs are scary, um, you know, lots of people might say things like that. Dogs are scary, don't like dogs. Uh, well, it's saying, no, the truth is, of the matter, that you had an experience with a dog which caused you to feel fear, and you haven't processed the fear yet. Um, but as soon as you say dogs are scary, now that's completely warped your perception of all dogs and all future experiences, and, and it's outside of time. And, and unfortunately, a very large, significant proportion of our logic and thought processes are based on those kinds of judgments. And if you look at the court system, it's all judgments, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, well, we don't really know what happened, but we're judging that this happened. So you're screwed. Um, and so the idea is to rec understand all of this, first of all, and then experiment with releasing judgments. So you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, I forgive myself for believing for so long that X, Y, Z, you know, like, I'm not a good person, or, you know, whatever it is. I, I can't achieve my goals, or whatever it is, it could be anything. And you'll find as you start proceeding through that, the emotions come out as well, because you, you feel relaxed, and maybe you can have some anger at uh, these things. And the key is to feel all the emotions around the issue as well, and express them in private if you need to, um, using sound. So the idea is that every emotion has a sound signature. So people like to talk about their emotions, but that's not enough basically saying you need to let your body shake with the emotion and actually process it like a, a vibration because we're vibrational beings. So you're improving your emotional power through doing that and your willpower as well. Um, and you're clearing out all the junk at the same time. And that's very effective at, at causing balance and, and increasing intelligence and health and everything that we need. Uh, so that's the basic overview of what I do. And um, denial is quite complicated in, in that Denial could mean anything. You could deny anything. It's simple and it's complicated at the same time. You know, I could deny absolutely anything about the world, but then I can also deny that I've denied, and that's when there's a serious problem because you know, then when people say, when they trigger you into realizing you've denied something, you, you just can't be reached. You know, you're like, no, I'm not denying. It. No, and you, and that's what kind of what we're talking about with the systematized people. They're in denial of being in denial, and they don't even realize they've done it. So it's like they're hypnotized, and what can you do other than you actually have to understand the mechanics of how they got into that place in the first place, and then help them somehow, which you're not probably going to have to do on the street very easily, like de-hypnotize themselves and sort of wake up a bit. And some people need very powerful triggers in their lives before, before that's going to happen. You know, and, uh, it might mean a family member going into ending up in hospital, or, you know, before you realise you have to change your diet and things like that. And even then, a lot of people don't change, you know. So, um, but for me. The key point is to realise that judgments are a form of unconsciousness, which is also denial of consciousness. Um, and we need to be conscious, obviously, to improve everything in life. The more we understand, the more successful we have. So, the more you go into this process, the easier it gets, and the quicker you realise the benefits of it. And, um, and it is not, it's not that difficult to work with, but it means putting more time into your own internal reality than maybe most people do. And, and you know, basically, you're not going to watch TV anymore. You're not going to be doing the things that distract us. You're going to be focusing on improving your own state of being. And, you know, it's not that hard, but you're not going to get results without doing that. It's just that simple. There's no pill for it. There's no TV program. There's no simple solution other than you improving your own consciousness. So, um, I can happily talk about this, like, for probably for, for days, but that's the, the shortest answer I can give you to that question. <laughs> well, it's been really great talking to you. Um, Thanks. And uh, hopefully we can have lots more conversations. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if you have any comments or questions for us for the next um, meeting that we have, then please put them in the comments in whatever forum these are going to end up. Cheers. Thanks for Thank uh, you. thanks for your time, Danny. Yeah, and uh, hope Thank you have a good time with the cryptocurrency uh, show. Which